Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth Transnational Law Signature Lecture. We are very honored and fortunate to have here with us today Professor Kenneth Armstrong, who is Professor of European Law at the University of Cambridge and has been since 2013. And that chair was previously held by Sir Alan Dashwood. Before joining the faculty, Kenneth was professor of EU law at Queen Mary, University of London, and he has also held positions at Kiel University and the University of Manchester. He has held visiting positions at Edinburgh University, the European University Institute, and at the New York University School of Law. He's a fellow of Sydney Sussex College. Kenneth has written extensively in the field of European Union law and policy, with a particular focus on the evolving governance and institutional structures of the European Union. He's editor-in-chief of the Cambridge Yearbook of European Legal Studies, and currently writing a new book called Brexit Time that will be published in spring 2017 by Cambridge University Press. He also tweets and sometimes blogs. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to come this evening and uh, talk. Uh, I think like many other European lawyers, uh, Brexit is proving to be good for business. Uh, we, are, we, we seem to be in demand. Uh, how long that's going to last, who knows, we, we shall see. But what I want, want to try and explore with you tonight, um, something around about the, the kind of free trade dimension and its relationship with, with Brexit. And the title of the talk is you know, Brexit and Free Trade Cause and Effect. And just to try and think through some of the issues about how free trade has really framed the UK's membership of the European Union, both as a cause of its membership of the European Union, but also it, as a cause of Brexit and also as a potential effect of Brexit. So those are the kind of things that I want to really uh, talk through with you. Let me see if this actually works. Yeah. Okay, so the outline of what I want to talk about is um, say something about causes Brexit and then to focus more specifically on the, uh, an idea about how one reconciles economic internationalism uh, with political nationalism. This is a bit more what, what I mean by that. And really, I want to look at this across three different sort of phases, the kind of past of uh, free trade and the UK's decision to join the, the, the then EEC in uh, the early 1970s through to the present, and a sense in which free trade is very contested, and that how and why it's contested, and also where it's contested, not just in Europe, but also beyond, and I'll say a little bit, but not too much, about presidential elections in that regard. And then finally, say something about where does free trade fit in the options for the UK post-EU membership? What is, what's on the table, what's possible, what's likely, what's, what's not? And the conclusion is a relatively simple one, which is a question, which is, is Brexit time a time of free trade or not? In thinking about the causes of Brexit, I mean, I cannot begin to, in the space of what we want to do tonight, think through all the different causes. They are multiple. There's a new nationalism out there, uh, exemplified in the idea of taking back control. Um, there are, of course, the, the issues around about migration that featured very, very strongly uh, in the, uh, the referendum. There's a kind of background issue about austerity and what the economic consequences of austerity have been for particular individuals and groups. But there is also a, a bigger background feature about globalization and free trade more generally and who the winners and losers are out of free trade. And I think one of the key challenges um, is in a sense how to make the effect of Brexit, what sort of Brexit we are going to end up with match with the perceived causes of it. And I think that's going to be a particular challenge for the future of free trade. 
free trade and its linkage with free movement of people. So there's going to be a real difficulty in making what might be, for some, the optimal outcome of Brexit at a political level fit with what voters thought they were voting for when they, they voted to leave. My last kind of preliminary point is I'll give you the key points of what I'm going to say now, just in case you kind of drift off or you stop tweeting or using blogs or social media. Um, so the, my kind of key takeaways are, 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 I guess, as follows. that Of course, the UK's membership of the European Economic Community was itself a sort of compromise of both nationalism, of constraining national sovereignty, but also constraining its internationalist free trade hopes. It was having to do, having to make do with a second best, a regional free trade uh, agreement rather than something more ma multilateral, something more global. That was simply the political calculation at the time. Since then, there has been, although Europe has been divisive for both left and right, more or less some degree of consensus amongst the major parties in the UK on the idea that the European single market is, is a good thing and in fact sees the UK's EU membership almost as a form of market membership. And I think one of the key things in Cameron's attempt to exclude or minimise the words of our closer union was because he wanted to insist upon a different type of membership, that of market membership. But what has happened is clearly the centre ground has fallen away and free trade is much more contested than it has been. And that's not just in the UK, but elsewhere. Now, the, UK, the, the EU is out there looking for bilateral free, free trade deals that it may do. But the prospects of these deals are becoming more difficult. And I think that pose, makes the, the current climate for Brexit a very difficult climate. So, let me say something about this idea of nationalism and internationalism that I've mentioned a couple of times. It's a, a relationship that I borrow from a paper that Stephen George wrote back in 1991 where he talked about the UK's membership in, in terms of the relationship between nationalism and internationalism. Now, the challenge for any government, I think, is how to pursue any kind of domestic national policy agenda and an international one at the same time. Now, for someone like Alan Millward, the historian Alan Millward, then of course Europe was in some sense one way of dealing with this. It was the European rescue of the nation state. There was a positive sum relationship between nationalism and internationalism. Uh, European cooperation was a, a means of safeguarding nationalism against its potential erosion by uh, uh, wider global forces. Now, left and right politically vary in their pursuit of both nationalism and internationalism, and they vary over time. And I think we see new political forces are, are changing the political calculus in seeking alternative outcomes and reshaping the relationship between nationalism and internationalism. And I would argue that what has been the effect of Brexit is to try and maintain an idea of a hyper-nationalism, hyper-sovereignty, at the same time as hyper-internationalism. Free trade deals galore. And I just wonder whether that particular balance of hyper-nationalism and hyper-internationalism will play out in the way that uh, certain political uh, actors may think. So back to the future, the UK outside the EEC, of course this was how we started, the UK arrived late to EU membership and is now departing early. The post-war, of course, the UK support for closer European integration involved the UK being outside of the structures and processes that drove the creation of the European Economic Community. Uh, Churchill was, of course, very famously in favour of even a, a federal uh, Europe, but as long as the UK wasn't involved with it. And, of course, the UK 
sought a different type of internationalist agenda based on free trade through the European Free Trade Association as an alternative to the kind of sovereignty inhibiting uh, European economic community. And in many ways, the idea of a regional European trade arrangement was less satisfactory than perhaps a bigger prize of a more global free trade possibility. And of course, we have to remember that 1947 GATT is signed and the, the, the hopes and aspirations for, for multilateral free trade were, were certainly there in the UK well, was, a, was a part of that. And of course, the UK also had very strong and close trading ties with the, still with the Commonwealth. So it wasn't necessarily all that obvious to the UK that European trade arrangements were primarily where its, its energies and interests should, should lie. The move to joining the EEC, I think, can be explained in a number of ways. Of course, the European economic community wasn't just a free trade area. It was much more intensive than that. It, its scope was more expansive. It wasn't just goods. It was services. It was freedom of establishment. Uh, there was also a customs union uh, and strong competition policy. The, the, the tools and techniques that were available to support um, liberalized trade were, were, were strong. There were credible political and legal institutions, which isn't to say that they didn't encounter problems through the 1960s. Of course, they did, most famously the French empty chair crisis. But in a sense, they were still nonetheless credible. And fundamentally, the UK's economy wasn't doing so good. The 1960s was not a great time for the UK economy, uh, uh, fairly ha hazard currency instability as well. And despite the US committing to free trade through the, the Kennedy round of GATT negotiations, the, a more expansive approach from, from, from the US towards uh, free trade. The hopes of a, of a North Atlantic Free Trade Association that would include the UK, the US, and many of actually the UK's Commonwealth uh, counterparties came off the table with the, with the Nixon administration by the end of the 1960s, early 1970s. So that hope of a bigger prize of, of more global free trade wasn't necessarily on the table. Put simply, Europe was on the doorstep. It was there. It was credible. It was, it was functioning at a more intensive possibility for trade liberalization. So why not? And others like the UK, Denmark, uh, sorry, the Ireland, Denmark, and Norway were also seeking uh, membership at the same time. No, we didn't in the end join. We joined and then immediately started thinking about leaving. This is a very British approach to, uh, to, 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 to our membership. Um, although in the 1960s, both the Conservative and uh, Labour had reached agreement, uh, consensus on the idea that membership was a, was a good thing, both under Wilson and, and of course, Ted Heath. Um, Labour immediately started to raise concerns about the terms of membership that Heath had negotiated, political instability in the UK with more general elections held then in 1974 with the Wilson, Wilson Labour Party promising either a general election or a referendum on a renegotiated deal. Again, echoes of Cameron's attempt to renegotiate uh, conditions of membership. Now, the great, so-called great debate of 1971 uh, was around whether the, the UK should, in fact, join in the end, and of course we did. But the 74 election did bring Wilson into power, and he attempted renegotiation, got something fairly minimal, and then put to the country in the 1975 referendum, which confirmed EEC membership. Moving forward from there through the 1980s, although in the early 1980s, Labour decided it would now become outrightly hostile to membership, and the 1983 manifesto famously argued that the UK should leave the European economic community and get cheaper food on the world markets. I think it was 
one of the phrases in the, in the manifesto. Following that, though, nonetheless, from that period onwards, and particularly under the, the Thatcher administration, very strong support for uh, UK membership, particularly of a single market, and the UK very firmly behind the, kind of the 1985 Commission White Paper on an Interior Market, and also the Single European Act reforms to make the single uh, single market uh, a reality. So the, the this picture, which has now become more famous, or of Thatcher with her with her uh, European jumper in the 1970s, of course she still was in favour once the UK sorted out its budget contributions, the famous Fontainebleau summit, summit, then the UK was prepared to push ahead along with its European partners. So we seem to have arrived at something of a consensus where membership of a single market is a good thing as a, as a style of membership for the, European, for, for, for the United Kingdom. Nonetheless, the single market itself poses certain kinds of dilemmas and, and, and trade-offs. It's a very, uh, it's not, as I said before, it's not just trading goods, but stronger commitments to, to liberalization of services, the freedom of establishment, movements of capital, and also the customs union. But these are then also, in, in a sense, sovereignty constraining in a number of ways, not least through harmonization. What is distinctive about the European Union as a trading organization isn't just these rules of non-discrimination, but the capacity to re-regulate at European level in core areas of regulatory standards. But that is also then sovereignty limiting for member states insofar as member states no longer are free to adopt their own rules in, in conflict with, with EU harmonized rules. But they nonetheless aim at achieving a sort of level playing field in the European Union and, and I suppose an idea that it's not just about free trade but also fair trade, that there are rules in place to uh, not, not just ensure health and safety and consumer protection but also some degree of possibly worker protection. The problem there is that while we have a large number of harmonized rules on product standards when it comes to things like worker protection, we know that countries like the UK were particularly against any development and further expansion of a, a strong social dimension. And we ended up with the, the famous opt-out on the European Social Charter. And we also began to see worries and anxieties about the reach of the single market it's fine if it's the free movement of mineral water or glasses or chairs, whatever. It starts to become rather different when things like the health services become subject to EU free movement rules and concerns about public goods and public services as being subject to, to market discipline. So one of the key questions might then be, when we look at the, the European Union, to what extent did it put in place mechanisms to manage the consequences of free trade? Was there kind of a bargain between allowing free trade but with some forms of compensation? Primary focus has been on managing change at a regional and at a sectoral level. EU funds to support periphery regions and areas through the Structural and Cohesion Funds. But where you've got a limited EU budget and limited EU welfare competence, it does prevent more direct income protection or maintenance measures. National sovereignty is retained in these areas of the welfare state. But at the same time, on the economic side, forces are beyond the boundaries and are more global and are then placing certain degrees of pressure on states. The EU does, of course, have a variety of trade defense instruments to try and protect the EU market, for example, for example from external dumping of cheap goods onto the EU market. So what I'm saying is that in terms of mechanisms of compensation, we have some in respect of these trade defense instruments. but 
on the more social side of it, we lack a uh, bigger EU budget or welfare competence to more directly compensate and to more directly compensate at the level of the individual rather than just at the level of the region and um, putting in place new kind of infrastructure product, uh, projects that are building new railways or roads, etc. So we see some very specific anxieties, I think, developing around about free trade in the single market in respect of the freedom of establishment, the right to decide where it is you want to set up um, your business or to, to move businesses. We have examples of uh, the Viking case where the um, Finnish ship, shipping company decided to disestablish from Finland because of higher wage costs and um, re-established then in Estonia uh, with uh, a more favorable regulatory environment for, for that company. On the po post of workers side, freedom to provide services was showing uh, some anxieties there about what happens when you've got a service provider in the case of one member state taking its workforce with it for particularly construction pro projects in other member states and being seen to undercut uh, wage levels. And of course, the Laval case was the extreme dramatization of, of that. Uh, the movement of workers uh, post-EU enlargement is the issue that has been more directly framing the, the UK's uh, referendum, particularly round about the idea of, which can be, of course, contested around about, around about, this, around about the idea of uh, its impact on, on wage levels. But more generally, deindustrialization, what's happening to these big styles of industrial production, new, leaner, digitized, more ro robotic mechanisms that are just changing the how goods are being produced and the offshoring of some of these uh, elsewhere. On the one hand, to the advantage of consumers and having cheap uh, non-EU imports, but at the expense of jobs in the EU. Which brings me to Brexit. Now, the kinds of anxieties that I've been trying to lay out in a very broad way, of course, are experienced very differently. They're experienced very differently across the UK. They're experienced very differently in London than they are in Sunderland. Um, London has done very well at the single market, particularly out of the financial services uh, industry. And at the same time, it's done well on the, more generally on the services side by being able to attract a lot of both skilled and non-skilled migrant workers to meet demand within the capital. Elsewhere, though, expensive and less efficient manufacturing has, has lost out with job losses for British workers. We think particularly of the steel industry and the controversy around about the uh, Tata steel uh, uh, production. Certain service sectors, especially hospitality and catering, have grown, but typically by employing migrant EU labour. And you take a very you walk out of this room and across, out into the street and you find pret a has got numerous outlets along the street and pret a has a huge non-UK EU uh, labor force. So the economy has grown, but the, the way in which this has grown is, is very symmetrical across goods, services, but also geographically. And following the 2008 crisis and the recession that followed from that, we saw unemployment spikes in key parts of the UK that then coincided with the, uh, the next wave of enlargement from Romania and Bulgaria that in certain uh, local authority areas in the UK, you do begin to see some level of, of change in the population in those, the, the, those areas. But the point I'm trying to make is then that these, this feeling of Brexit or what was motivating Brexit probably just felt very differently where you were. And the idea that this was a close vote in the end is, I think, incredibly misleading. 
It is a close vote once you just add up every of these individual votes and count what each person has won. But you look at the areas, you look at geographical areas, and there's large areas where we had very, very strong votes on both sides of Leave and Remain. And that tells you that there's a much more local experience of, uh, of these, these issues. The politics of Brexit. Conservative Remainers focus very strongly on the benefits of the single market while failing to address any of the effects of, of EU and global free trade. Labour Remainers more or less repeated the same mantra, but with a light sprinkling of references to the importance of workers' rights without any real sense of whether, in fact, they thought it was a good or a bad thing that the, the EU, uh, or well, actually, without any real sense of actually what level of protection there was at EU level and whether there should be more or less is given such a virtue. Conservative leavers complained about the impacts of harmonization on national sovereignty while claiming uh, potential for new trade deals outside the EU. Labour leavers complained about globalization and the need to fundamentally change the global market economy. UKIP vote leave concentrated not just on the flow of jobs out of the UK but simultaneously what they saw as an influx of migrant workers into the UK, a kind of double whammy. Jobs are going abroad, but at the same time, there's also this, this migrant uh, worker uh, issue. This then has, creates new challenges, I think, for left and right. Vote leave cuts across both left and right. Its nationalism appeals to the left and right. Its internationalism largely appeals to the free market right. Hypernationalism is hyper-internationalism. Where are the Conservatives now? Well, they're split between those for whom market membership <laughs> is and always was their understanding of European Union membership and for which they were in favour. And they want to see a Brexit that corresponds as close to single market membership as they can get. But there are those for whom this regional free trade deal is simply actually was never enough, and this is the opportunity to go out and become the global free trade champion, a phrase that has been used uh, on a number of occasions now, not just by the Prime Minister, but also by a business secretary. Labour is, in my view, absolutely nowhere. Its policies are nationalistic, with some desire to remain linked to the single market, Jeremy Corbyn said it in one sentence in a speech this week to the CBI, but without any clear philosophy uh, as to what that means. So there's a much more expansive nationalism and a kind of reduced internationalism, I think, for where, for where Labour now stands. So in terms of interpreting where Brexit is going to go, where it's going to end up, I think Vote Leave manages to pull off this incredible trick of uniting left and right around this idea of a, a hyper-nationalism and hyper-internationalism. Um, the Conservatives are split, and Labour is just standing on the sidelines waiting to see what's going to happen and hoping it doesn't have to pick up, pick up the pieces. But it's not just a purely UK or a European issue. I think the US presidential elections has told us something very interesting about more globally what is happening round about issues of free trade. And that actually this is, this is an issue that is changing on both left and right, not just in the UK but elsewhere. Certainly during the presidential elections, free trade became, it, it became a polarizing issue both on the left and on the right and in between. Donald Trump defied traditional Republican support for free trade by his vocal opposition, um, in particular to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. He was appealing to blue-collar workers in areas that had been impacted by the relocation of jobs. And of course, we have, have this delightful video from um, President-elect Trump telling us that day one in office, he's going to notify the intention of the US to withdraw from the Partnership. 
On the left, Sanders, Bernie Sanders, took a very skeptical democratic stance on free trade and particularly on TPP. And in doing so, he exposed how much mainstream democratic opinion had actually allied with Republican opinion in much the same way as left and right had done around about the idea of the single market, I think, in the UK, that free trade was broadly okay. Yeah, you needed to do something kind of side payment side. And of course, Kennedy back in the 60s had introduced these kind of trade assistance adjustments, which were directly in, uh, directed at providing compensation at the level of firms, but also the level of individuals who were losing out through free trade agreements. Sanders, I think, then took a much more skeptical stance as a way of creating very clear water between him and Hillary Clinton. And together then, the kind of center ground consensus collapsed. After a degree of flip-flopping by Clinton on the question of whether she did or did not support TPP, and there's a wonderful um, newspaper uh, piece where 45 times where Hillary Clinton supports TPP, only to throw it under the bus uh, in, alongside her running mate who did likewise and they both came out uh, in, in opposing uh, TPP. So we ended up in a situation I think where there is strangely on, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, in the UK and in the US a some degree of anxiety about um, where free trade uh, takes us. And it's not at all clear that the, the Trump presidency is going to be in any way, shape, or form uh, promoting new trade deals. He may be moving more softly on the existing NAFTA arrangement, but certainly new free trade deals appear to be part. And of course, for the European Union, that also then means that the TTIP negotiations are very likely to be part for some time. Free trade, though, free trade deals remain important for the European Union. It's still a key priority. Multilateralism through the WTO um, has slowed down. And the EU has been embracing free trade deals, focusing on the uh, ASEAN countries and uh, doing deals with Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, etc., as well as uh, South America. TTIP was, of course, the big prize that it wanted, was to secure uh, a deal with the US, but I think that is very clearly on ice. What looked like was going to be the big success for the EU was the Canadian Free Trade Association, CETA. Um, plane tickets were booked. Press conferences were to be held. Justin Trudeau, the glamour boy of Canadian politics, was going to come over. Be a big signature ceremony, and everybody would be really happy. And then suddenly things started to go odd. Um, they went odd round about the not just the signature of the deal, but its provisional application. Court challenges broke out, particularly before the German Constitutional Court, uh, trying to halt the provisional, the, the signatory and provisional uh, application of the, 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 the CETA deal. In the end, the German Constitutional Court waved it through as long as the provisional application didn't extend to certain claims, including its uh, investment court uh, dispute resolution. And then the Walloon Parliament decided that it was going to recall its consent to Belgium's signature uh, on the deal. Hence, plane tickets cancelled, news conferences cancelled, and further meetings to try and find some way of managing this rebellious socialist um, regional parliament. Now, in the end, we found a way through, things have been signed, but we're nowhere near yet full ratification of this, and we can imagine that there will be bumps along along the way in in that regard, and particularly round about the new investment court system that is seen as one of the centerpieces of this new arrangement viewed as being 
preferential to these forms of investment, arbitration, uh, dispute resolution have been uh, so criticized in other free trade deals. So where then does all of this leave Brexit? As I've said before, the UK government is championing the idea of, of a new era of global free trade with the UK at the, at the heart of it. But it is far from clear to me that the political climate externally is one in which free trade is, is flourishing. And non-EU partners will only invest time and energy in securing deals with markets that they think are worth trying to get access to. You simply have to ask the question of whether the EU market of 27 is more desirable than the, e than the UK market of one. I'm sure many of you will have seen the reported conversation between Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson and the Italian Foreign Minister, was it? I can't remember. Where um, Foreign Secretary Johnson was saying, well, come on, you want to sell us as goods, we want to sell you goods, we, we buy your Prosecco, he laughed. To which the reply was, yeah, but we sell Prosecco to 26 other markets, you're just one. And I think it's that sort of realization that actually that the, the game has changed. The EU is a market of currently 28, soon to be 27 states. And if there is going to be time and energy put into what are difficult, complex, and politically fraught negotiations, you're probably going to invest them in the ones that you think are, are going to have the, have the biggest gains. And I think we've already seen Canada suggesting that while it's not uninterested in doing a deal with the UK, it's much more interested in securing the deal that's already done with, with, the, with the European uh, Union. Where then does that leave the, the shape of Brexit? What sort of Brexit are we going to end up with? As I've said before, and right at the beginning, the difficulty is going to be uh, a gap between where the political elite are. I don't mean the elite in any pejorative sense. I just mean those who are actually charged with doing stuff. You're actually going to have to make decisions on this, particularly government, where they are in terms of what they think would be a good outcome and where voters are politically. Vote Leave and its campaigners and its supporters, their preferences are all suggesting a hard Brexit with exit from the single market and WTO rules applying until any new free trade association, any new free trade agreement is in place. Political elites may prefer something much closer to a European economic area uh, style of agreement with intense trade cooperation through the single market but without, but without a custom gene. The Foreign Secretary, however, has seemed to be suggesting that he actually wants something like a free trade agreement plus a customs union, sort of EEA plus, uh, which I think it has to be the one that is the least close to where the vote leave preferences uh, really lie. So what then are going to be the options? As I've said, hard Brexit is one. Joining the European Free Trade Association, going back to that original uh, second best alternative, and taking advantage of its free, trade its free trade agreements that it has. And that could be or could not be without also becoming a signatory to the European Economic Area Agreement. As I was reminded earlier, of course, Switzerland is in EFTA, but not a signatory to the, uh, the EEA uh, side of things. Other alternatives are, and this uh, I think we've seen some suggestion of, of a strong association agreement, something a bit like the EU-Ukraine association agreement um, with a very comprehensive trade and political cooperation set of arrangements. The difficulty, of course, with that model of an association agreement is that it requires unanimity and it requires national ratification with the potential of referendums as well. And you will remember that the Netherlands held an optional referendum on ratification of the Ukraine agreement and the vote was no. 
So it's a very risky option for the UK to go down that route. Alternatives might be to have some degree of sector by sector arrangement. Let, let's accept the, the, the nature of the UK economy. We build cars, we have financial services. Let's just do free trade deals on those things. The difficulty is going to be making them WTO compliant because of the requirement that any free trade agreement to be acceptable from a WTO point of view has to cover substantially all trade. And that sort of cherry, cherry picking and slicing up may be more difficult to achieve uh, legally. We seem to end, end up back at the idea of a free trade agreement of some description. The question is always going to be, what sort of one is it going to look like? Is it going to look more like a Canadian one or a slimmed down version? The more comprehensive it is, the risk is that it involves issues that are also within the competence of the member states, making it a mixed agreement. And then we have the same problem as we have with the association agreement. That is, you then have to have domestic ratification. It's Walloon, Walloon Parliament all over again. Or we try and have a narrower free trade agreement. One that isn't perfect, but will focus around the exclusive competence of the European Union under the common commercial policy. There is an important case, which many of you will know about, that is before the Court of Justice on the uh, EU-Singapore free trade agreement. And at the core of this is the question is, what falls within the exclusive competence of the European Union under the common commercial policy? What, what can be done as a matter of exclusive competence? How wide or how narrow is that? Now, that judgment is due next year. The Advocate General has finalized um, her opinion. It will be agreed and come out early next year. How long it will take for the judgment to follow from that largely depends on whether they agree with the opinion or not. The opinion is likely to be extremely lengthy because it's a very complex matter. But you can guarantee the government lawyers will be poring over this endlessly to see what scope it would give a post-Brexit UK to negotiate a free trade agreement within the terms of their exclusive competence in the common commercial policy to try and avoid, avoid all these, these, these kind of, uh, veto points. Let me finish with some vague conclusions. I think there's two paradoxes involved in the government claiming that it's going to be the champion of global free trade after Brexit. The first is to do with the causes of Brexit, the forces at play in free trade and globalization, that these forces are in part responsible for Brexit. Making post-Brexit trade fit with Brexit politics is going to be difficult. Government will be torn between nationalistic politics and internationalistic economic ambitions. And the second is that this is just not a very conducive atmosphere at the moment in which to pursue internationalist trade. The UK joined the EEC, not least because Nixon poured cold water on a North American free trade deal. If Trump is going to do the same, where exactly is that going to leave the UK? If it pulls out of the EU, what's left? The Commonwealth? But the Commonwealth has, I think, moved on. Canada wants a partnership with an EU of 27 or 28 member states, not a UK 